If you're a newbie to AWS, chances are your experience goes something like this. You create a new AWS account. You log into the AWS console as the root user. You build things, you test them, and everything works just fine. Then you deploy an app or a feature to your users or your friends who are helping you test things out, and nothing works. Nobody can access things or they all just fall apart. Duh! Suddenly, you care a lot about Identity and Access Management, or IAM, and this here, Google, is probably your next step. Maybe you can relate. This was definitely my experience when I got started. So in this video, I'm going to try to distill what I wish I had known then and explain it in a way that's easy to grasp, since IAM can be a little bit overwhelming at times. In short, Identity and Access Management, or IAM, is a service that's used to securely control access to your AWS resources. It controls authentication, or the who, and authorization, meaning what they can do. There's four main concepts we're going to cover, users, groups, roles, and policies. Let's take them one step at a time by actually doing these things out in the AWS console. I've logged into the console here. If you need to know how to create an account, check out the video linked above. I'm going to navigate to IAM. I'll just type that in up here. Identity and Access Management. Click on that. And I find that users and groups are fairly straightforward for most people, so let's start there. I'll click on Users. And let's just dive right in and create some users. So Add Users. First user will be Michael Scott. And we can actually add multiple users here from the same screen. We'll do a second user, Dwight Schrute. And then you need to select the access type. Do these folks need programmatic access, if they're using the CLI, the SDK, and so on? Or are they just going to come into the management console like we are here that requires a password? We'll go with that option. Generally, you want to auto-generate the password and then force them to change it when they sign in. For this demo, though, I'm going to specify the password here and then deselect this option to reset it and then click on Next Permissions. Now, just to tease what's coming up in the video, we will be covering groups and policies, but for now, we're just going to go to Next Tags. This is a way you can organize things, maybe by job title or organization, but we're going to skip this as well. Go to Review. And you'll see here on this screen, by default, users have no permissions, and that's an important point. We'll set that up later, but for now we have two users, Michael Scott and Dwight Schrute, who are not part of any groups and don't have any permissions. So we'll create users. And then here with your success message, you have a link where these users can log into the console. Remember, we gave them console access. You can also download a CSV that has the username and the link, and you can also send them an email. I'm just going to grab this and copy it to my clipboard. We'll need it a little bit later. But let's close out of this, and then I'm going to add one more user. Back to Users and Add User. This user I am going to grant programmatic access, so I need to do it separately from what we just did. But we'll do one for Pam Beasley. Programmatic access here, as well as console access. Once again, I'll specify the password. Deselect this, and then I'll just go through the rest of the wizard. We're not going to add to groups or set up permissions right now, but just create the user. Because Pam is going to have programmatic access, you'll see that she gets the access key ID here and a secret access key, whereas Michael and Dwight didn't get that because they're just getting console access. Obviously, you'll want to keep these in a safe place, but let's move on. I'll close, and now you'll see the three different users we have here. Dwight's pretty happy about this. Now, this is a good time to point out that as a best practice, Amazon recommends that you always work as an IAM user and never in the root account. The root account is an account that's automatically created when you set up your AWS account. It has full access to everything, including billing, which can be great when you're getting started because everything just magically works. But if it's ever compromised, you're in pretty big trouble. So it's best to create an IAM user account like we just did that has the least amount of permissions that you need to do your work day to day, and then lock away those root credentials and don't use that account. OK, back to the console. Now let's look at groups. Come into user groups here on the left. I find these are also fairly straightforward for folks. A user group is just a collection of IAM users, and you can specify permissions for the entire collection instead of having to do one at a time. So let's create a few groups here. First one will be for developers. 
and Pam is our developer in this group, so we'll select Pam. Once again, we're going to skip permissions for now, and we'll create the group. We'll create a second group for testers. Dwight's going to be our tester. He'll be happy about that. Create group. And then finally, we're going to have one for admins. And Michael's going to be an admin. Scrolling down, create group. All right, so at the moment we have three groups and three users, which checks off the top two things on the list here. We're moving right along. But there's this other construct called a role. You might have noticed that back here in the console on the left, roles. What is this all about? Well, if you read at the top here, an IAM role is an identity you can create that has specific permissions with credentials that are valid for short durations. Roles can be assumed by entities that you trust. In plain English, a role is similar to a user in that it's an identity that can have permissions to do stuff, but a role doesn't have credentials as you might traditionally think of them. There's no password or keys or anything like that. And a role can be assumed temporarily by anyone or anything that needs it. If that still doesn't make it any more clear, let's walk through an example to hopefully illustrate why roles even exist in the first place. Say that you're creating an EC2 instance, video linked above if you want to learn more about that, and this instance is going to host an application. Your application needs to be able to use S3 for storing and retrieving files, and it also needs to publish logs to CloudWatch. A pretty common scenario. How do you go about this from an IAM perspective? Well, there's a couple options. Option one is to create an IAM user for the application that has all the appropriate permissions to use S3 and CloudWatch. And then hard code the user credentials into the application or store them on the EC2 instance's file system and retrieve them at runtime. Now, even if you don't know how all of this works, that option should hopefully, intuitively, feel a little bit like this for you. Hard coding credentials and storing them on the file system is never a good idea. So let's just agree that that's really not an option at all. Just forget that I mentioned it. But this scenario is really why roles exist. The second option, and really the only one you should be using, is to create an IAM role with the appropriate permissions for S3 and CloudWatch in our example. And then when you go to create your EC2 instance, you assign it to that role. And by doing this, the EC2 instance assumes the role and it'll have access to S3 and CloudWatch, no credentials required. In the console, when you go to create your EC2 instance, you'll see where you can assign the role here. And the tooltip says basically what I just mentioned, that the role automatically deploys the credentials that you need to access the resources. So no username, no password, no keys, or any of that stuff to deal with. A much, much better way of doing things. To build on this concept a little bit more, let's use a hat analogy for the role. You'll often see this icon used when you're talking about AWS roles. In real life, you've probably heard the expression that somebody's wearing a lot of hats. In your own life, maybe you juggle different hats of being a parent, being a software engineer at work, maybe a soccer coach on the weekends, a home chef for yourself and your family, maybe a therapist to your friends. You wear a lot of different hats and play a lot of different roles depending on the day or the hour. Well, it's similar in AWS. You can assume a role by putting on that hat. And when you put on the hat, you can do everything the role can. Maybe there's a role that says you can read from S3, write to CloudWatch, and read from DynamoDB. That one role does all of those things. Or maybe there's a different role that says you can only read from S3, or even another one that says you can write to CloudWatch. Whatever hat you put on or whatever role you assume, that's what you can do. And this example is using the EC2 instance from earlier, but the same is true of users or groups. They can assume roles too, and in the same way, temporarily, the user would be able to do the things that the role can do. If you go out to the console and create a new role, you'll see that you can choose common use cases here like EC2 or Lambda or whole other host of use cases. And we're gonna do this in a little bit. By the way, if you're finding this useful so far, I'd really appreciate you hitting that like button so it can be shared with more people, and also consider subscribing. Much appreciated. All right, to summarize what we have so far, these are the identities or the who is doing something with the AWS resources. We've got users, groups, and roles. But as we saw earlier, just having an identity doesn't mean I can do anything. In fact, by default, you can't do anything, as Dwight is pointing out. If we go to the console, 
And let me just open up a new incognito window here. We'll go to that URL I copied earlier that gives Dwight console access. And let's log in as Dwight. Dwight Schrute, password, and sign in. Let's say that Dwight is trying to get to S3. He wants to go look at some buckets or some files that we have out there. You'll see that he really can't do anything. He doesn't have permission to list the buckets or view all the different buckets we have. And the button to create a bucket is also grayed out because he doesn't have the ability to do that either. So poor Dwight is an IAM user, but that's not doing him any good right now. We need to tie everything together and hit the final construct of policies. Which brings us to the last item on the list. Simply put, a policy says who can do what to which resources and when. For example, allow IAM users to rotate their own credentials programmatically and in the console. Or allow a Lambda function to access a DynamoDB table. Allow a user to start and stop EC2 instances. Just some examples. Here's the basic syntax of a policy. The top one, effect, you have two options here. It's either allow or deny. Deny is the default that's automatically applied. So if you don't specify anything, it's going to default to deny. And then you've got your action. And this is going to correspond to the API calls to the various AWS services. The example here is for S3, the ability to delete a bucket. Then you have the ARN, or Amazon resource name. This specifies the resource you want to apply the permission to. For example, apply permissions to a specific EC2 instance based on the ID in this example. Or maybe it's a specific S3 bucket, and you'd get that ARN from the bucket properties. And then finally, we have conditions. These are optional, and they control when the policy should be applied. For example, only apply this policy if the username is John Doe or apply another policy on EC2 instances only if they were created three months ago, that kind of thing. Now applying those to an example policy, here we're saying that if the IAM user is equal to whatever username we put in here in the condition, this person is allowed to start and stop instances. And the asterisks here mean they can start and stop any instances, not just a specific one. And then we've also got this down here that allows us to describe or list instances, which will let us check the status of instances. Let's go to the console and look at a couple other examples. Here on the left, I've clicked on policies. I'll type in administrator here and filter these down. And coming into administrator access, there's two ways you can view things. I'm on the JSON tab here. This is how I actually prefer to look at things, but there is a summary view as well if you don't want to look at the code. And here you'll see basically we're allowing full access on everything. That's what the admin gets to do. So allow everything on everything. Let's look at another one here, maybe for S3. So I'll just type in S3 at the top, hit enter to filter things down. There's quite a few here. Let's just go to the read-only access on S3. And here we're saying that whoever has this policy attached is allowed the get star and list star, in other words, read-only access on all the S3 buckets. So those are just a couple of examples. Feel free to look around some of the others. It can be quite instructive. But back to Dwight. He's reminding us that at this point, he still can't do anything, even though all those policies are great and all. And he is correct still. The who here comes from attaching a policy. A policy just by itself doesn't really do anything. As mentioned here on our list, we have to attach it. So we want to take the policies that we've been talking about and attach them to users or groups or roles. So back to the console. If we navigate back to users, we have Dwight here. We just click into his username. And you'll see at the moment, this user doesn't have any permissions. Now we could go and add permissions directly on Dwight by attaching policies directly. But remember that we also have Dwight in a group. If we back up one level here, there's a tab for groups. We've got him in the testers group. And it's generally going to be better to manage things at the group level so that any other testers are going to get the same permissions that Dwight has. So let me click into the group. Here we have a tab for permissions. 
At the moment, this group doesn't have any permissions either, so we're going to add permissions, attach policies, and let's say our testers need some S3 access. So we'll filter down for S3, and we'll go with S3 full access, and scrolling down, add permissions. Now if we go back to that tab that Dwight is logged into, and refreshing the page, you'll see Dwight's the logged in user here, and now this looks a little bit different. He's able to see all of the different buckets that are already here, and he can also create a bucket. So full access to S3 now. Yay, Dwight. All right, back to our other console tab. Let's go to our other groups and attach some policies. So back to user groups. This time we'll come into the developers group. And on permissions, we'll add permissions, attach policies, Let's say that our developers also need S3 full access. You can select multiple policies here without having to go through the full wizard. Let's say they also need DynamoDB, and we'll go with full access, and also Lambda. And there should be a full access down here. Here we go, so select that one, and then scrolling down, add permissions. There's the three different things they're going to get. And then finally, we have the administrators group, or admins. And for this one, coming to permissions, add permissions, attach policies. This one, type in administrator, and we'll give administrator access, which again is access to do everything, basically. And there we go. Now, backing up to roles, since we hadn't really talked about policies previously, I didn't want to get into roles too much, but let me just show you how to quickly create a role. So I have some in here from other work that I've done. You might not have any on your side, and that's fine, but you can always create a role, and you'll see the common use cases here. Let's say we have a team at the company that does e-commerce, and their EC2 instances need the ability to access CloudWatch and S3. So we're going to create a role for those instances to assume at startup time. So common use cases, EC2. And then down here, next, permissions. We'll attach policies similar to what we just did with the users and groups. This one will be CloudWatch. And there should be one for CloudWatch logs, full access. Here we go. And then the other one, let's say these instances are going to need S3 access, but we can get by with read only. This one right here, I'll select that. Next, tags. Again, we're going to skip this, but it's a good way to keep things organized. And on the review screen, this is where you're going to give your role a name. So maybe this is e-commerce service role. We'll create the role. And now when we go to start up a new EC2 instance, it can assume this role, which is going to let its applications access S3 and the CloudWatch logs without needing to worry about credentials when the application's running. All right, we've covered quite a bit, so let's summarize here. We talked about users and groups. Users are just as you'd think, a Michael Scott or a Dwight Schrute. Users can be part of groups, and you can give everybody in the group the same permissions. Roles let you temporarily assume permissions without needing credentials. The common use case here is that an application on an EC2 instance needs to assume permissions that allow access to S3 and CloudWatch. And finally, we saw that the actual permissions are defined in the policy. Whether you want to allow somebody to read from S3 or write to a DynamoDB table, all of that's specified here. And then the glue that kind of holds everything together is to attach the policy to one of your identities, the user, or the group, or the role. And those are the basics of IAM on AWS. Hopefully you found this helpful. Let me know below in the comments, and thanks so much for watching.